and welcome to the next keynote from Bob Ifolito. I met Bob when he was involved in Luthunia in Vilnius in 2006, where he was also hacking on the PyPy project. And of course, he was also on several Python conferences. But he actually, instead of continuing with PyPy, he went on doing something very commercially viable. Uh, he founded uh, Mochi Media, um, a company around advertising. And as it happens, he, is now, he doesn't need to uh, work anymore for, for earning money, but he can now go to conferences and uh, give interesting talks and play with lots of fun things. And one very interesting thing he's also doing is he's involved in Mission Bit, which is an educational program in San Francisco um, for teaching children, high school, um, programming, all kinds of stuff. Um, <laughs> And he's doing that on his own uh, time, simply. And he's also sometimes looking for the next big thing to be involved in, but uh, he's not eager to actually get there soon. <laughs> so um, I'm very happy that we have him here because he's, he also wrote the HTTP, uh, major HTTP server in Erlang. He has helped uh, evolve the Greenlight library in Python and lots and lots of different things. I think you have also been involved in the JSON, simple JSON parsing stuff. And, you know, he's, he's done lots of stuff in Python, but also in Erlang and recently also in Haskell. So I think he's a perfect guy to tell us a bit about what Python can learn from Haskell and functional languages. Bob, it's you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak here today. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, about some of the things that I don't like about Python, but uh, starting off, uh, I have done a lot of Python. I've been doing it for a long time, since about 2001. Uh, most notably, I'm the author of the Simple JSON library, which I, I still reluctantly maintain. Uh, and I, I worked on a bunch of Mac-specific stuff, PyObjective-C, and all of that stuff. So either you're welcome or, you're welcome or I'm sorry, uh, especially to Ronald over there, who still maintains it as far as I know. Um, and as Holger said, I founded a company called Mochi Media, and I worked there for a while, uh, but not so long after I sold it. I've been using Haskell for a couple of years now. Uh, most notably, I ported the exorcism.io curriculum to there. Exorcism is a website which has uh, programming practice problems in many, many different languages, including Python, but also uh, languages like Swift or F Sharp or Haskell, whatnot. Uh, so I worked on the Haskell curriculum and I provide a lot of code review to people that submit solutions in Haskell. These days, I do a bit of advising and investing. Uh, I write, up, write open source code on the side and I teach and I'm on the board of a nonprofit called Mission Bid in San Francisco. But you know, we, we hope to expand beyond that uh, once we've sufficiently covered the San Francisco area. And so but before I start ragging on Python, uh, let's just say that Python is not all bad. Uh, but I only have 45 minutes to talk, so I'm only going to talk about the bad things. Um, <laughs> I love Python's community. There, there are so many great ideas and libraries that come from here. And, you know, Python works wonderfully for many users. I'm sure most of you are perfectly happy with Python. And for the issues that do exist, there are often good enough workarounds, like PyPy, Numba, Cython, et cetera. And uh, I'm, I'm actually not going to talk too much about Haskell, but uh, suffice it to say that Haskell's not all good. Uh, I, I learn a lot from it. I, I think it's fantastic. but. Uh, notably, it has a much smaller community. Uh, this non-strict evaluation stuff is just so different from, from how most other languages evaluate code. Um, sometimes the documentation, it's not a website with, with some nice documentation. It's, it's like a postscript file that you download that somebody wrote for their PhD thesis. And, and that's kind of okay. That's accepted in that community, uh, although that's changing slowly. Uh, And, and it, it can be intimidating to some because the, the terminology mostly comes from mathematics. So you uh, have to become comfortable saying things like monoid, functor, monad, et cetera, uh, which you know, it takes people a little, a little time to get used to uh, if they haven't taken a category theory class. 
And so if, if you're perfectly happy with Python and don't want it to change even a little bit, uh, you might want to leave now and go downstairs and, and uh, hang out with all the cool companies in the basement. Uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I was a lot happier with Python until, until I started learning other languages like Erlang and Haskell. And I, I didn't look for other languages until I really hit an area that, that Python just wasn't very good at, and that's concurrency and network programming. Uh, and I, I feel like I'm a better programmer having learned all of these different approaches to problems. And uh, a nice little quote that I ran across recently, uh, and I think this explains some of what we have in Python today. Nasty little paradox. The better something works, the less likely it'll be improved. And so the, these are some of the things that, that I find that Python makes it hard to do. Python makes it hard to write code that works. It makes it hard to maintain code. It makes it hard to create good abstractions. And it, it certainly makes it hard to run code efficiently. And so uh, on the correctness topic, you're going to make mistakes in any language. It doesn't matter if it has an amazing type system or uh, anything else. You're going to make mistakes. And the key is, is to have tools that tell you what those mistakes are. But Python defers all of that to runtime. So unless that code path happens, it's not going to tell you anything. The only thing it can tell you is if you use tabs instead of spaces, or you know, may, maybe if you put a colon in the wrong place. Um, and sadly, the, the static analysis tools for Python today are very, very primitive. They could be better, but it just hasn't been an active area of research. I think this is because the people that, that can understand this problem and know a lot about type systems and inference and whatnot uh, basically move on to other languages that, that support these things more readily. Um, and you can write code in Python that you know is correct, and you do that by writing a lot of tests. But some of these tests are, are things that, that it should just be able to do for you. Like when you write an integer literal somewhere, you know it's not a string, and you shouldn't be able to add it to a string. And so given that, here's, here's a simple example of a perfectly PEP8 compliant Python file uh, that shouldn't do anything. The language guarantees that this code will not work because uh, int and string are closed. You can't override how they behave. You can't change what plus does. So no matter what, this code is just going to blow up at runtime. And we can very easily just glance at this and know that that's the case. There, there is no universe to which this code uh, should do anything, uh, unless maybe you're introspecting the bytecode and doing something horrible, but don't do that. And so let's see what Python thinks, all right? So we throw the Python compiler at it. We use this nice compile all thing, uh, which I often use in automated testing because it tells me if I screwed up the syntax. And what does it do? Well, nothing. It compiles the file. It's totally fine. I get bytecode. No error, no warning, nothing. And so another popular tool for, for looking at the surface of Python modules uh, is PyFlex. So I run PyFlex. It also tells me absolutely nothing. And so what about PyLint? OK, so I wrote all these nice doc strings, and it's perfectly formatted. So this is, this is 10.0 out of 10. I did nothing wrong here, nothing whatsoever. It runs all these tests, and it's perfectly fine Python. Uh, but I, you know, it's obviously not the case. And do better tools exist? Well, I certainly couldn't find anything. And if I couldn't find anything, that's bad. Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, I, I would love to hear more about that. Uh, to my understanding, that's, that's an IDE or something. But maybe we can talk about that in questions after. <laughs> OK, so, so nothing, nothing that I could readily find uh, could catch this simple case. Uh, most of the tools are concerned with just the general case of Python, where, where you know, anything can happen, and dynamism is cool, and, and uh, you can override things at runtime, and, th and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so, so it's very difficult to write one of these tools when you accept that, that every feature of Python is great and it should be used all the time. But I, I don't think that's the case. I think we should write more restricted code, just that, uh, you know, in the same way that, that we should indent consistently by either two or four spaces, depending on uh, where you come from or where you work. Uh, and 
The thing is, is that Python 3 already has the hooks that we need to do very good um, annotations, and we can use those annotations to tell the tools what we expect to happen. And there, there is a tool that, that works in precisely this way, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So here's what some other languages do with that example. Uh, here's the Erlang version. So uh, it's, a, it's you know, a, a little more verbose in some ways. And what does the Erlang compiler do? Well, if I, if I try and compile this, it says, warning, this expression will fail with a batterith exception. And the interesting thing to note here is that Erlang is a totally dynamic language. It's not statically typed anywhere. Uh, it has optional type annotations, just like Python 3 does. And Erlang also has even better tools. Uh, it has this tool called Dialyzer, which does static analysis and success typing and all this fancy stuff. And this gives me a more specific error about exactly why this is wrong. Uh, I can't add one to, to a string because it expects them to both be numbers, given the first argument. And the fact that plus doesn't work on lists. There's a separate operator for that in this language. And here's the, the Haskell example. And you might be thinking, oh, wait, where's the type signature? Well, there it is. Um, but this, this is the full Haskell program. You note that, that it's, it's uh, you know, just as simple as the Python one, if not simpler, because there's no underscores to be seen anywhere, no equals or ifs or none of that. You just write main and what main should be, and then that's that. And if I throw the Haskell compiler at it, it's going to give me an error. It says I, I can't add the number one to the string one. And to explain this a little bit, we can kind of gloss over this because it doesn't really matter. Um, so it's saying this num chair thing because by default, lists of chair are strings. So that's what the chair in square brackets is. And operations such as plus, minus, times, negate, et cetera, belong to the num type class. So it's saying that there is no instance of this num type class for lists of chair. Um, and you could, in theory, implement such a num type class, but you really shouldn't do that. Only truly numeric types, such as int, double, rational, et cetera, should implement this num type class. Uh, the Haskell folks are, are um, they, they like to write type classes only when there are algebraic laws that you can uh, apply to them. And here it's the, the law for uh, this particular category. And so why is refactoring in Python hard? Well, it's hard to refactor without good tests, and not everybody writes good tests. Uh, the types are very obvious tests, and they're also documentation. So in one way or another, you're writing the types here anyway. And re has, refactoring is much easier in Haskell than it is in Python due to these types and also referential transparency. Um, can we do something like this in Python? Well, the answer is yes. So first we have this pure Python, nothing fancy, breadth first, breadth first traversal of a graph. So we have a starting node, which is some, some number, and then edges, which is a dictionary of numbers to a list of outgoing edges. And we do the simplest possible bad algorithm. We have a, a list of all nodes that we visited, a list that is the queue of nodes to visit, and uh, we simply go about our business traversing that queue and appending to it uh, as needed. And so we're going to do one little thing here is we're going to add type annotations to it from this typing module. And uh, so it's going to tell you all of the things that I just had to tell you in order to understand this algorithm. The starting node is an integer, the edges is a dictionary of integers to list of integers, and it uh, returns an iterator over integers. And the only other thing that changed here is I had to annotate that visited as a list of integers, because as an empty list, this particular tool couldn't infer that. But not, nothing else had to pollute this code. It's not, it's not C or, or you know, old C++ where I have to annotate visited and queue and, and node and, and tell the compiler exactly what I expect it to be. It can infer all the details. And then what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this algorithm a little bit more efficient. So I know that, that if I use a set for nodes that I visited and a, a double-ended queue or deck for uh, the queue, then it's a more efficient algorithm um, because uh, it's not a linear traversal every time I look through it. And so all I've done so far is I just changed the types. The only changes I've made so far are just these two lines. And obviously this, this isn't going to work because these data types don't implement the same methods. 
So I run this MyPy tool over it, and it tells me exactly everything else I need to change to make this algorithm work. And the only thing I had to do was, was change these two little lines, uh, just the types, that's it. And then it's going to tell me everything that's wrong with my program. It says that on line 11, this deck has no attribute del item, so that's, that's right here. And on line 14, set has no append, because it uses a different method name. So I can simply look in the documentation and see what I need to change. And so here, here's the correct algorithm. It's, it's very, very uh, simple. I just had to change uh, this to a pop left and this to an add, and now it works. But my pie was able to tell me exactly where to look in the code to make that change. And so is my pie the solution to this problem? Well, you know, it's the most sensible approach that I've seen so far. But the author needs some help. There are many tasks uh, that, that need to be done in MyPy that uh, don't really require deep knowledge of MyPy itself or type systems, such as annotating parts of the standard library or third-party libraries. And uh, although MyPy does great stuff, uh, it doesn't yet catch the very simple integer plus string error yet, but it can catch many other mistakes, such as the one that I just showed. And so why, why is PyPy or Nwitka or Cython or whatever uh, so not a solution to the problem. Well, these projects are mostly concerned with just performance. They don't really try and help you make your code more correct. They don't, they don't help with code quality. But MyPy uh, aims to do both. But I think right now the important part is helping us improve our code quality. And the, the nice thing is, is that this is just Python 3 annotations. That code runs exactly the same whether you're using MyPy or Python 3. In Python 3, it's not going to do any of this type checking, but the code works. So it's fully portable to any Python 3 runtime. So my modest MyPy proposal here is that we adopt this as a standard. We should start using this typing module or, or you know, some standard derived from it, even in vanilla Python 3. Like all the code in the standard library should have these annotations. The documentation tools should be able to read these annotations and automatically write out nicely formatted documentation with hyperlinks for all the types and all this nice stuff. And we need, we need to stop using function annotations for anything else. Uh, as far as I understand, they haven't been widely adopted for any other purpose. So I think it's a good time to draw a line in the sand and say that function annotations are for type annotations. And, and just move forward with this proposal um, and, you know, help us improve Python's code quality. And the, the nice thing is we don't, we don't really have to rely on the quality of the MyPy interpreter or compiler or any of that fancy stuff. We can just use it as a linting tool, as, as just a step and uh, just a set of tests to run over our code. We can continue to use PyPy3 or Python3 or perhaps even the older Python VM once uh, MyPy is backported. And uh, what, what you can do now is start contributing to MyPy uh, and, and uh, you know, may, maybe write an official pep for, for this proposal because I'm probably not going to do it. And so, so what? Well, the code quality tools in Python are really far behind other languages. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what PyCharm does, but I, I suspect that, that it's not quite as good as Erlang's Dialyzer or, or, you know, Haskell. And MyPy is a huge step forward, and it can be used with our existing tool chain. The only thing we have to do is upgrade to Python 3 to make it work today. And, you know, that's something that, that we've all been trying to do for the past couple of years. Uh, and the only thing we'd have to give up is using function annotations for any other purpose. And, you know, I don't think that's a big deal because I haven't really seen too many elsewhere. And in a way, without giving any meaning to function annotations, it's hard to use them for anything at all, except for some domain-specific, library-specific purpose. They're only truly useful if you can use them, you know, in all of the modules that you write. And another thing that, that uh, I, I have trouble with in Python these days is, is mutability is just everywhere. You can't turn it off. Uh, and I think it's the wrong default. It's a very, very common source of bugs. Even, even the, the beginner case where, where you're using uh, default arguments and you, you have some keyword argument set to the empty list or an empty dictionary or an empty set, 
and uh, you get behavior that you don't expect because people expect it to always be an empty set. Uh, but you know, if you add something to it, it won't be empty anymore. And it also prevents many optimizations. Uh, you can't you can't do any multi-threaded stuff without locks if if things are going to change all the time uh, in unpredictable ways. And uh, mutability should really be opt-in. And so why why should it be opt-in? Well, it's hard to understand code when the underlying data might change. You can reason about it locally, but you really have no idea what else is going on especially in a multi-threaded environment. The value of something could change from one line to the next. And this means that you, you, either, you either give up and, and just hope that nobody does anything bad, or you do all kinds of defensive programming. So anytime you return uh, a value uh, from, from your class, say you're, you're returning self.value, you're gonna make sure that that value is a, is a deep copy or, or uh, you know, something like that. Every time you, you wrap it in some way, or if you want to use it as a key in a dictionary, you have to just copy, copy, copy. And copying is slow, especially for large, deep nested objects, and sharing is prevented by copying, uh, unless these already happen to be immutable types, like frozen set, or frozen dict, or integers, or strings, or what have you. And uh, these days, we care a lot about concurrent access, and concurrent access requires synchronization if everything is mutable all the time. And so, can we even fix this? Well, I don't know. Because to truly fix this, you're going to need some really large changes to the, languages, uh, to the language in the libraries, as we know. Because we've been trying to get rid of the gil for longer than I've been using Python, and it just hasn't worked so far. Um, but if, if we're trying to fix this, we can look towards languages like Rust or Swift for good examples. Because these languages have opt-in mutability. So in, in Swift, for example, if you use var, then you're declaring a mutable variable. But if you use let, then you're saying that that is a constant, even, even for a data structure like a dictionary or a set. So maybe that's a bit more practical for, for Python to adopt. And another thing that, that really gets me about Python is that all of the abstractions are, are really expensive. Um, so some things like PyPy's JIT can change some of the constant factors here and there. But uh, ultimately, almost nothing is free. Function calls aren't free. Classes aren't free. Nothing gets optimized away. So you're, you're encouraged to inline code all over the place I, I, and, and like, you know, make local references to globals and, and all this gnarly stuff. Like if you, if you want to see what, what this does to you, go, go look at the simple JSON code base. Uh, <laughs> uh, because, you know, I, I hate doing this, all this inlining, all this stuff, because it's, it's not fun and you don't want to do it with, with decorators or AST manipulation or anything like that. You just do it. And it, it makes it more code that's harder to maintain, but you do it because you get a 20% speed bump here, a 20% speed bump there, and you just live with it. And, and I, I really don't like that. And the other thing is, is that it, uh, classes in, in Python are open. You can always subclass them. You can, you can do all sorts of naughty things in classes, and it makes it really hard to analyze them for correctness. Uh, basically, subclasses ruin everything. And so uh, a solution that other languages, particularly the, the ML family of languages, have come to is having a syntax to easily declare algebraic data types. And so I, I'm not including Scala here, so uh, other languages do this reasonably. Uh, and Python over the years has grown a lot of, a lot of hacks to, to sort of give us some of this, like the, the new uh, enums in uh, Python 3.3, I think. Uh, named tuple, uh, et cetera. They, they all solve little pieces of this problem. And even uh, like the destructuring assignment in Python is sort of a subset of what you get with algebraic data types in other languages. And so here's, here's an example of, of what a typical problem looks like for a Haskell developer, say. You're, you're working with abstract syntax trees. So here I am in Python. I, in order to say something is an abstract, abstract syntax tree node, I have to define this class. Uh, all, all this class does is, is define an eval method. Uh, and then I have to define all of the different types of AST nodes. So there's a constant, which takes some integer. There's this minus thing, which is like a unary minus to negate the node. And then 
I have to define add and multiply. And you can see that, that it's quite a lot of code to do this when, when ultimately it could be a lot simpler. And so here's, here's that whole thing in, in Haskell. Um, so in, in Haskell, I have the boilerplate to say, oh, hey, this is a module and this is what it exports. So in Python, I would have done that with under, under all, but I didn't really have room for it. Uh, and here I'm declaring all of the different types of AST nodes. There's a constant node, there's an add node, minus, and multiply. And all of that is very succinctly described. I can look at this and I can see, oh, these are all of the things an AST can be. If I look at the Python, I look, oh, maybe I should grep this code base to see if anything else subclasses AST anywhere. You don't have to do that in Haskell, it's closed. These are the only possibilities here. There are ways to do extensibility, but you don't always need that. And it's, it's harmful if you have that all the time because you can't, you can't analyze this to say, oh, you didn't, you didn't uh, implement uh, evaluation for minus or add. It can't do that statically. And so here's, here's the whole evaluator in Haskell. You, you typically don't do this with separate functions for each type of node. You just do it in one function. And the compiler can tell me that I handled all these functions appropriately. But the, the cool thing is, is that in Haskell here, it can do a lot for me. So here I'm saying deriving show and eek. And so what this does is it automatically writes the code for me to make sure that these have a sensible wrapper and implements like under under eq in a reasonable way. So if I were to do that in Python, this is what it would look like for just that one specific node. So, so in Haskell here, I have this amount of code to solve the whole problem, but in Python, it's that much code to solve the problem for just one particular node. So it's, it's very difficult for, for me to go back to Python and, and work on these types of problems without ripping my hair out. <laughs> because Python just gets in my way, and, and none of the tools can tell me if I've done it right. And the other thing is, is that in, in Haskell, we, we often write a lot of abstractions, and we know that the compiler can unroll those, those abstractions for us. You can use something called new type to just make a wrapper around a data type that totally evaporates at runtime. So if you say, have a, a float in your library that really means time, and you don't want to be able to add time to pounds and have it succeed, you can wrap t the float for time in a new type that, that doesn't allow you to interface with other types without unwrapping it first. And this is also used for things like, like booleans and whatnot. So although there is a representation for true and false that, it, that are one and zero appropriately, you have to unwrap that with, with from enum. Uh, so there, there's no reason to have code like one plus true equals two in, in Haskell because you can, you can have this very efficient representation and w without paying all this cost all the time. And the other thing that, that languages like Haskell can do is, is in these abstract data types, if it sees that the field is strict or, or uh, you know, meets the appropriate criteria, it can unbox it. And th this is something that, that is very hard to do in Python. Uh, you can get a little bit of it with PyPy and, and you can erase some of the cost using slots and stuff, but, but with uh, like Haskell or Swift or whatever, you just get all this stuff for free. You don't have to think about it. And even function calls can be inlined. So you can, you can write small functions that abstract little bits of code and you know that you're not gonna pay for it because the inlining actually works, even cross-module. Although you, you do get some of this with PyPy. And so on, on the performance topic, I, I'm not going to focus too much on that because everything I've talked about provides more ahead of time information. And this information could be used by tools like PyPy, Numba, Cython, MyPy, et cetera. And the important part is that these features save developer time by making it easier to write code. But also, this information can also be used for optimization and it can lead to better performance. And the, the trick here is, is that once it's easier to write better code, it's easier to optimize it because you can refactor it and you can have these types guide you to the correct implementations. And the other thing is, is we, we really need to write less code in C and C++. Uh, 
Um, because th this, is, this is what holds us back. This is why it's hard to remove the gill, because we all depend on NumPy or whatever, and these, these APIs are written in C, and they, they need to work with the reference counting and acquire the gill and release the gill. And we're, when we're held back by that, it's very difficult to change anything. Um, but when we have implementations of all these things in pure Python, it's much, much easier to change the semantics. So thank you, PyPy, for, for spending all of this effort over the past decade or so uh, making this uh, even reasonable today. And so un unfortunately for, for the same uh, basic reasons, the Python C API is, is really holding us back from doing concurrency properly. Uh, it's not even something I can talk about solving until some of these other things are addressed, like mutability and, and not depending so much on these C libraries. Um, and, but once we do those things, then fixing the other deficiencies are going to be possible. But, you know, there, there is somewhat of a silver lining here. Uh, it's been shown that it's possible to have a mixed approach where you, you write code in a subset of Python, uh, like PyParallel, where that subset of Python can be compiled and work completely independently of uh, the typical Python VM object system. And so, in, in summary, I, I really think that we should look long and hard at incorporating all of the good ideas from MyPy into Python, possibly even just the implementation as is. And after that, we can add some more of the conveniences that we find from other modern languages. And to, to do that, some of us are going to have to learn languages like Haskell or Erlang or ML or, or Swift or F Sharp and actually come back to Python. Um, but it, it is a worthy endeavor. Uh, even if you don't go back to Python, I highly recommend learning other languages. Uh, I have learned so much by branching out a bit. And if we manage to do some of these things, then we can, we can enjoy a safer, faster, and much more capable Python in the future. And thank you. So thank you, Bob, for the very honest analysis. I think typically at Python conferences you get a lot of, uh, you know, hailing how great Python is and all this. And I think it's, uh, I enjoyed this very much to have a, from a long-term Python user and also involved in other languages to get this honest analysis. So, um, questions um, to Bob? Yes, Mike? Yeah, I got a question because I'm learning Haskell myself. Do you think it would be feasible to use Haskell as an extension language for Python, writing all those things, concurrency, recursiveness, trees, where yeah, Haskell is really good, and writing extensions and really make them nice Python objects? Do you think it's possible? I, I think it, it is possible. Uh, certainly all of the FFI that you would need is exposed by Haskell to do that. Uh, I'm not aware of any library that makes that particularly easy. Uh, most of the effort is kind of the other way around, where you're writing code in Haskell and you want to interface with C or Objective-C or something along those lines. Um, so uh, un unfortunately, I think the upfront cost would be high uh, to write all of the code to, to expose Haskell ADTs as nice Python objects. Um, but if you were to do something that, that was a little more decoupled, where, where maybe you're expecting primitive values in, primitive values out, that that would be a lot more straightforward to implement. Um, but uh, I think that, that uh, as a learning exercise, that might be a bit tricky, like diving into the FFI and, and how to cross these barriers. I think it's much more uh, reasonable to, to try and learn Haskell uh, in isolation, maybe speaking over a network to Python, rather than linking to it as a C extension. Yes? Um, just a small comment about the static analysis thing. Um, Jedi is going to be able to find most of those bugs you presented. Um, it's very new, so you can't know it, but still. <laughs> well, I'm going to well, talk about it on Wednesday. Okay, great. I'll, I'll have to come to that <laughs> talk. Thank you. <laughs> 
Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I just wanted to share some. Uh, there, I, I see some correlation between uh, the dynamicism of a language and the size of its community. If you look at JavaScript, Python, uh, even PHP, they are all dynamic languages with huge communities. And if you look at, let's say, Scala, Haskell, uh, Erlang, they are like very small, tight communities with very correct, very uh, people focused on good programming practice, but also on correctness. Maybe there is some relation, may, something in, in the fact that they are dynamic that makes their communities grow so, so fast and so lively. So maybe by proposing a more static approach, uh, Introducing that would, would actually hurt the community side. Something to think about. I, I think that's, that's certainly an interesting consideration, but there are some very easy counterexamples, such as C or Java or C++, uh, which have uh, presumably larger communities than, than many of the ones that you cited. Uh, and here, what I'm proposing is not mandatory. Uh, it, it is opt-in. Uh, full dynamism is still permitted. It's, it's simply encouraged to add these annotations where they're possible and sensible. Um, and anything else would be simply inferred. Uh, so it's not like C or Java where you have to write it everywhere. Uh, it, it's more like the ML family of languages where, where it, it just happens. And I, I, I think there, there are other reasons that have nothing to do with the type system, why, why those particular communities are are smaller or larger than, than others. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question myself, also because I'm involved a lot in, in testing and functional testing of systems. Um, to me, it always felt that you have, for any sufficiently large system, you anyway have to do some kind of testing, right? And you, want to make, and you want to make sure that you have some kind of coverage on your code, so actually your code lines are touched. And as soon as you have something like that, like a, a test suite where you test the behavior, not just the types, but much more than just the types, you get as a side effect the type chatting. So your example of like the integer one plus string uh, one would easily cause an error in this test suite, but the tests also provide much more. So basically my question is, if you have a more powerful type system, of which I can see the use, of course, you still have to write tests. So you basically have to add more overhead and strictness there, and you have to write uh, your test suite. So are you actually gaining that much? I, I think that that's an interesting point to bring up. Uh, of course, you would, you would write tests, but you no longer have to write so many of the obvious tests. And in, in languages where you do have these annotations available, there are tools that can either uh, exhaustively or uh, like randomly generate input. Like, like basically, it writes fuzzers for free. So in, in Haskell, I can, I can write a quick check property uh, based only on the types that, that will generate you know, small inputs, big inputs, randomly to, to try and find errors. And th those tests are much, much shorter to write because this information is available. Um, and the, the, the advantage is, is that it, it tells you what tests you need to write and additionally. Like say, for example, you have uh, a library that accepts some input as JSON and you, you write the test for, okay, what if the input is a list? What if the input is a dictionary? What if the input is uh, an integer? But you forget to test what if the input is a float. I, but the, the types, because they're, they're separate types for each of these things, uh, you can look at, you can try and compile it with something like Haskell and it can tell you that you don't have a case for floats. So you can very easily write a lot of tests and get a lot of coverage in, in Python and, but miss these, these cases that the type checker is going to catch. And um, the, these type annotations are very succinct. You, you don't have to write many of them, basically just in uh, the arguments to your functions, and, and you end up writing that anyway in, in some less principled uh, doc string format somewhere, because the user of your system has to know what goes where anyway. 
So this is just moving that, that information into something that, that is actually verified, uh, either at compile time or runtime or both. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, if you allow, I would just like to expand on uh, your answer and uh, answer another thing of your question. And it's not only um, the correctness and testing that uh, where um, the, the um, extended typing helps, but also the documentation of the problem, uh, the program. Programs become much more maintainable when the developer immediately sees what type is returned and what type is expected of any arguments that go into the function, the function that makes the uh, development much more, well, well, easier. And also, it allows uh, tools to understand the programs. To, uh, it allows you tools to navigate the program much more quickly, like you can do in Visual C or probably in PyCharm or uh, IDEA, et cetera, in Eclipse. So it uh, helps uh, develop much better tools that uh, allow you to program much more efficiently. It's not only the correctness part. It's just, that's just my two cents. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. That is absolutely correct. OK. Then thank you again, Bob. We're just directly going to start. Yes, sorry. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much, Bob.